Are we waiting for anyone else? There's one more. We can get started? All right. So, as Lamar mentioned, my name is Latoya Chanel, and right now we are going to be interviewing the cast of TV pilot Three Blind Mice. All right? So, first and foremost, I want to know from right here, going down, please introduce yourselves and um, who you are in the pilot. Yes. Hello, thank you all for coming and your patience. My name is Imani Nia Robinson. I'm the creator, writer, and star in Three Blind Mice. Hello, everybody. God's good. Uh, my name is Anthony Holland. Um, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, and I am playing Damon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Hall. I'm Armani Scott. I'm actually the producer and a uh, co-writer on Three Blind Minds. I'm mostly the attorney on it, I guess, on counsel. I'm the attorney, producer, writer. Okay. Hey. <laughs> we wear many hats. We wear many hats. Absolutely. Imani, creator, writer. Tell us a little bit about Three Blind Minds. Well, Three Blind Minds is my baby. I've been working on it since I was in high school, the concept of it, because I have a very unique black experience, which you'll see momentarily. And it has taken us five years to put it on its feet. Um, there's a lot of patience, but a lot of love, and I'm just so thankful that the cast and the crew have stuck with me through all these years. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what's the premise for Three Blind Lives? Uh, like the log line? Yes. So Three Blind Lives is about um, a black girl who was adopted by a white family, and she grew up in predominantly white spaces her entire life. But in an effort to learn more about her past, she transfers to an HBCU in Baltimore and meets two young women who help guide her during her transition. So it's kind of like a millennial version of living single in a different world, but in current times, as you'll see. All right, do we have a clip that we're going to play right now? photo like I belonged I haven't felt that way since I guess that's why I'm still trying to chase that feeling to pattern. 
Patterson College? Kathy? No. Absolutely not. You're staying at Mount Lydia. It's the best school for you. For you, but, but, but Patterson was my first choice. You never told us that. You weren't listening. You know, Baltimore's gonna be a lot different than Massachusetts. Why do you wanna change your environment? I just, I want to connect with my people. We are your people. People who look like me. So before we really get into what we just saw, I just want to know the significance of the title. Where did you get three blind mice from? Right, so um, Naima, Muffin, and Brittany, the three women that you saw in the clips, um, they're the three blind mice because they're all in their 20s navigating through their adulthood. No one knows what they're doing, so it's like the blind being blind. So, you have this young lady raised in a primarily Caucasian home who has now ventured off into her African-American roots. Please tell me the significance of coming on campus, seeing all of the things that was going on, seeing the gentleman stepping, and what that was like as you were writing it. Well, um, my mom actually went to a university, and she was encouraging me to go to an HBCU, and I regret not going. Mm -hmm. So when I went to Homecoming, Howard's Homecoming, Lincoln's Homecoming, and Morgan's Homecoming, I just got so excited. And I just felt so lively, and I was like, oh my gosh, I really wish I had this experience. So I just wrote that feeling that I had into the script. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was more so of what you felt like you wanted to do. Yes, okay. so I feel like we're vicariously through this character and have oh, that wow. experience. Wow, wow. Yeah. And so to your, to your, co to your, I'm sorry, say your name again? Imani. Imani, no, to your right. Oh. Anthony, Anthony, can you explain your character's position in the film? Um, so my character is kind of like, uh, he's kind of like the, like the cool kid on campus, I would kind of say, uh, kind of laid back type of guy. Um, also was kind of mixed yet at the same time, but kind of also like kind of learning his way um, uh, with me kind of talking to, you know, Brittany having that, um, you know, that relationship and then eventually seeing Imani kind of swam my way. So I'm kind of, kind of, kind of in the middle of things, I would say my character is, but um, that kind of makes, I would say, um, the entire uh, project is interesting in itself and kind of, um, you know, kind of keep you going, kind of, you know, keep you interested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to know in writing, do you feel like, you know, as young 20 year olds, we actually have this conversation between the differences of where you grow up? Do you feel like people get on college campuses and although we can see the difference, do you feel like they have the conversation about the differences? Um, no, I think that. I don't know that they know how to have the conversation like thoroughly. Mm -hmm. I think they might just point out like, you know, you talk different or how Anthony's mm -hmm. character just says, repeats what I, mimics how I speak instead of really understanding that maybe we all come to different places. Mm -hmm. But from what I've gathered at HBCUs, there's a lot of, there's a, a wide variety of black individuals with different backgrounds who, who go there. So I really wanted to make sure that, that was represented. And do you feel like this is most experiences for people that haven't, not only haven't gone to HBCUs, but if you've grown up in a primary, predominantly uh, Caucasian area. So let me so let me tell you what I'm getting at here, right? So and our audience can can hopefully you guys can you know join in on this discussion as well. So if you're growing up in a predominantly Caucasian neighborhood, and for all of my African Americans who are in the audience, and the dichotomy of who you are when you're around your own people 
versus who you have to be to the rest of the world, right? So with that being said, I wanna know at a young age, because I feel like we see it as we get older and we know the difference as we get older, and I think the younger generation now is calling it code switching, right? And so you know to do that as you get older. Do you know to do that when you're younger, when you're in your 20s, that you have to code switch or that you must code switch or that code switching is imperative? Do we, do we, are we having those kinds of conversations in, in universities? Are we having those kind of conversations in families that it's, it's imperative to be able to do that? I want to know your thoughts on that. For me, I think I I was able to code switch mostly in white environments, I think, but I also did actually, I was in a lot of white spaces growing up, so I don't know if I was able to code switch in black spaces as well. So I kind of stuck out. I don't think I knew that it was called code switching. I just knew because I had to act a certain way or I tried to act different in certain spaces. Um, I mean, I, I think as far as in, in my in my point of view, um, it kind of when people kind of say like it takes a village. Um, when you're around, you know, people in certain spaces, and you uh, you know have family members who are able to correlate and be able to be in certain environments, um, whether that's dominantly white or dominantly black, but um, being able to, you know, handle themselves accordingly, um, I kind of feel like when you are in a situation where you are born into a family like that, they kind of pass those, um, I would say those character traits down to you. Um, but I would say also there are people who aren't able, who aren't blessed enough to have family members like that um, to kind of uh, be able to teach them in a way to you know, handle yourself accordingly in, in all situations and all um, areas. Right, because when do we learn that as a people, right? When, when and where do you actually learn that it's necessary? Thank you. Question, question for the young lady. So, growing up in a white environment, did you feel like, when you talk about code switching, which way do you feel was the real you? Oh, the real me? Yeah. Was um, it code switching? Was it the way you related when you were in a black environment or the way you related when you were in a white environment? Well, I was in a white environment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to say something? I think, um, actually, I have a thought that Anthony made a very good point that I start with. So when I was in law school, again, that the, the notion of code switching, I is a lot of different boundaries, right? So I'm in law school, and I'm a first-generation American. My parents are college graduates, right? Um, but then I come into contact with classmates whose grandparents are judges, right? So there's all of these different levels of experience, right, that I come into contact with. So I grew up in a home where code switching was speaking patois, right? And, and, right? And also code switching from a perspective where the civil colonial nations, where the British ideal, right? But even to us, we sort like being able to speak with a British accent is more mocking from my culture because we're Pan Africanists, right? So there's all these different levels of it. And then for me now, the professional, first coming out of law school and being a professional, where at least we were taught that the thing to do would be to code switch, mm -hmm. right? To get through and get by. But as we have gotten, I'll say older, more mature, <laughs> right? The notion of being one's authentic self, irrespective of the environment, is where the power is, right? You're, the notion, probably the notion would be Wu Tang Clan, right? Where at the point in time that they received commercial success, they weren't wearing shiny suits. They weren't doing tracks that were what the majority of what Madison Avenue would determine to be a crossover hit. So how is it that they became arguably the most successful, if you look back on it now, 
right? Mm -hmm. The numbers don't lie, right? You can put that up against like what Diddy did with Bad Boy, right? And culturally, right, what their music is now. They didn't code switch, so to speak. So what is really the way to get through? So as a uh, survival technique, right? Generationally, right? When I look at my peers, who are just a little bit, you know, I'm a little bit ahead of them in that regard. You know, the, they don't, I would not advise them to do that just to get through and get by. Like Anthony said, it's like, Having a grandfather who's a judge is of definite benefit in your law school because it's something you just don't you know because you have access to it. As opposed to like speaking with a British accent when you know and when you're in at the law firm, yeah. It'll be good to know what the salad spoon, the salad fork is. You know, so you know, again it's why I think the Monument Project stuff that's brilliant because where do we have those kinds of conversations in popular television? You know? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm um, Joni Robinson, Imani Robinson's mom, and I'm so thankful to. What was to, your job on it? I was. I'm the executive producer. All right. right. So I'm so, yeah. I'm so happy. I'm so happy to be here, and thank you for inviting us. It's been a long time coming. And I wanted to piggyback off of Imani's conversation and particularly what um, Armani spoke of. Um, I, I went to, um, <laughs> more than predominantly, I went to a, a white school. Uh, and we went to school together. Yes, we did. We went to Warlow Harkins um, School. So in my class, I was one of um, three black children in my class since I was 10 years old. And I don't know if it's personality, you know, because um, I, I raised in my personality. I don't know if it's because my mom's Carol and uh, all of what I saw every morning when I woke up, um, or sense of self or confidence, but I never code switched at the school. 10 years old, I was unapologetically black and confident every day and um i didn't see that with all the black children i saw them struggle in ways that imani's talking about that she struggled right, right and as a little girl i showed up like that every day and it was time to apply to colleges i'm the only black kid who applied to all black schools and i did it with confidence and i told the uh, guidance counselor um, and she wasn't so supportive but I still, I still did it. So I don't know um, all of the elements that make people feel that way and why my story was different. Um, and then I raised um, someone who felt differently. So I don't know what I don't know what that is. Um, but my my story was um, totally different. Yeah. So 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 I think it's cool to show up authentically as you are. Right. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And is that more along the lines, the point of Three Blind Mice, is it to show up authentic authentically as you are, no matter what environment that you're in? Yeah, show up authentically, but I just think it's really important to show um, a specific black experience. Because I don't think that what I've shown you guys today has been shown on TV yet, a black protagonist who's feeling awkward or uncomfortable within the black community before. And um, I think it's also important for me that I create black content that does not include um, a lot of violence, a lot of sex, and drug use. I don't think you need those things in order to have an audience each week. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I love about living single in a different world, that you, did, that you didn't really have any of that but you have like a loyal audience. And I want to bring that essence back. And you sh you can see so many different, a variety of black experiences in that one, sh in those two shows. And that's why I wanted to ask you, why do you feel like those shows were so significant? Cosby Show, Different World, you know, Living Single. Why do you feel like those shows were so significant to the African-American community? 
Um, I think it showed a positive representation of the black community, of black men, of black women. Um, it showed different backgrounds. Um, it had a message after each episode. It talked about current topics. Um, it was empowering, and I just really want to bring that back. Well, we had someone new who just joined us, who just ran in. Can you just go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us who your character is? Sure. Um, hi, guys. I'm Crystal T. Johnson, and I play Muffin. And tell us a little bit about Muffin. Wow. Um, Muffin, it, to me, she represents... Um, what society would call the more complex black woman. Um, you're not really sure what she's feeling, what she's thinking, but you can definitely see that she's decided to carry the weight of it all. Um, and I say what society calls complex because to muffins all over the world, um, and I know I've definitely had my seasons, um, she's, not, she's not complex to me. She, she, she sees things very simply. Um, and uh, I would say just, a young woman who decides in every room she's in to take charge, to protect, to care, um, and she's unafraid of how that looks and how it comes across to people. Um, so she's not trying to, and I love that you guys are talking about authenticity as I was sitting down, because she's definitely unapologetic and very authentic in that role, no matter how harsh it could appear. Um, but uh, she's a nurturer at heart. I'd say. Okay, Muffin. <laughs> okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you, so we're, we're, we're definitely talking about, you know, being in, in an HBCU, but you're also talking about adoption and feeling like you're a part of something. You know, one of your opening lines was, I don't, that's the last time I felt like I was a part of something. Do you feel like going to the HBCU made her feel like she was more a part of where she was or maybe missed where she had left? Um, you'll see, well, when the pilot comes out, you'll see that um, she tries many, many times to make it work because she really wants it to work and feel belonging um, with her people. But um, something does transpire where she kind of second guesses herself and then wants to give up to go back home. To where her comfort is, which she, she's used to. But uh, when the series continues, um, where she's at in Baltimore is where she really wants to be. So I guess that asks the question your people, is that nature or is that nurture? I don't know. Anybody in the audience? Miss Aura Bailey Hill. How are you? How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I have found that in being my authentic self, sometimes, not so much now, but when I was growing up in schools in Plainfield where at times I was the other, even if there were lots of us in the building, I was in classes where I was the other. Mm -hmm. And I found that sometimes we can be very unkind to one another. Uh, and I don't know whether it was the way they were raised or whether it was like the uh, rats in the barrel syndrome of thinking that you've got to <coughs> climb over somebody else to make it. I, I don't know what the reason or rationale was. Sometimes it was color-based. I had a young lady who used to tell me I was yellow. Now, she didn't mean I wouldn't fight. She meant color. It never dawned on me to tell her, you need to look in the mirror, because she was about 10 shades lighter than me. But my parents did not teach us racial comebacks. I raised my children not with racial comebacks, but with all kinds of comebacks, because they can be very protective, and they can make other people look at themselves. Wow. Did you want to comment on that? <laughs> I have to digest that, but that was beautifully said, and I there's a few things that it relate to. I I also too got lots of com, com, um, comments about my shade as well. I was also startled um, and wasn't really sure how to to have a comeback for that. As a little kid, I didn't know. Right. But, yes. You know, I learned, and and it wasn't that a member of the family told me. It was I sort of interpreted it and realized what I could do to change that. 
I, I definitely know for a fact that the colorism conversation is one that we really need to address. Um, I think the, the, our new generation feels like, oh, that's old people stuff, it's wiped under the rug, but I just think it's just so ingrained and programmed that we just don't question it anymore. But it's definitely a conversation that needs to be had. It's one of those kitchen table conversations that uh, we definitely should be having. But that's a, that's another topic. But uh, did you want to comment? Go just, ahead. Just briefly, I think, again, that was a beautiful response from the, uh, from the elders. Can we get your name again, please? Laura Bailey Hill. Yes, Sister Bailey. Um, so when I was in high school, I wrote a, a column in my high school newspaper about just that subject, being in the hallways and hearing, like, you know, hearing that comment, mm -hmm. right? And growing up in a home, again, with a Pan-Africanist, where that was so flexible, right? It, that to even suggest that was sort of like a self-own, a self-goal, and dissing yourself when you say those things, um, and feeling a lot better getting older and seeing, at least hearing my perception that we, we don't do that as much, but also still realizing again that it's very ingrained in our culture and society. So back to the initial question of nature or nurture, that is something that definitely has been nurtured in the community. And you see it, you know, you can see it in Guyana with East Indians and Africans, right? You can see it in different countries, you can see it in South Africa, right? With, with with the Bantu and the, and the, and the Indians Correct. there. You see it many different places, but it definitely is not natural to folk. But once it's been ingrained over generations, it, it could present itself as being something that we just do. But again, once the more we excavate those types of things, and again, I think the beauty of the casting of the show that Imani has done, the writing, the, the concept of it, it presents a space, again, where that conversation gets had in a way that's not ham-handed either. It just, you know, how many times do we get to have that kind of conversation coming out of TV shows that are getting made right now yeah. with, with our young, young people? So <coughs> thank you. Thank you again for that. Yeah, can I say, you know, um, just sitting here listening, I was like, wow, I guess that definitely, I mean, we've discussed it before, but I'm being reminded in this moment of how much it does play a part in Muffin and Naima's relationship um, on camera. Um, and a, a lot of why I think we view Muffin a certain way, when to her, it is natural. Like I was saying earlier, like, it's natural how I'm behaving. It's totally, you know, one plus one equals two, but to the world, you know, it would appear a certain way. And then I meet a person like Naima who just nurtured a bit differently um, and, and, and brought up a bit differently. You know, it would appear as though she can't quite understand why I move the way I move, and I can't quite understand why she moves the way she moves, but yet we're part of the same race. Yeah, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know if you guys heard her, but she was like, Muffin definitely experienced things a little early, like having to adult a bit sooner. Um, and I definitely find, uh, as a woman of my complexion, uh, I have noticed that in conversations and in passing, that like usually it is a little tougher to relate. Um, but I've always been excited to, I love that word you use, excavate. <laughs> I'm always excited to like, you know, I don't know what this is. And I wish, Bailey, you could have experienced that, and even you, Naima, and I hope this project starts that conversation or gets the ball rolling even more. But I don't know what this is, but we need to figure this out because we're one. You know, our journeys haven't been the same, but we're one, you know. So I'm excited to see how the series uh, evolves into that. Yes. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's, I think it's amazing. Like you said, the, the, the importance of shows like Different World, the importance of, of what you have created is so that we can see the positive images and maybe help to understand things a little better and at least have the conversation. All right, can we get to our next clip, please? Thank you.
Okay, we, we, we cut it right there, but we at, at a very good part because the question is, and, and I know we just kind of glazed over it a bit with, you know, we all are the same, but what is being black? That's the question. What is it? Right. Yeah. It was just, <laughs> that was like yeah, that's definitely the point um, of the scene to, 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 to have that conversation, but also to show how Naima comes from a totally different world than the rest of the group because she wasn't really able to understand that that was just like the dozens as they call it. They were just poking fun. They weren't really trying to be hurtful towards her, but she wasn't able to understand that. So it just supposed to show the two worlds. But even for the other characters, is blackness predicated on um, uh, that that part uh, that part of the culture, you know, just knowing those certain things or certain colloquialisms or so or certain television shows, is that alone blackness? Um, I think that to to be black, you should at least know um, about your culture. And those questions they asked was part of of, of 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 knowing your culture. I think that. They, were, they thought those were simple questions to ask and that she would know these something, but she didn't really know anything. Even seasonings she wasn't aware of. Mm -hmm. So, if I could say, so it looks like they thought that blackness come from having a shared experience of some sort. But the thing about it, at least in my mind, there are a lot of shared experiences that different groups of black people have, mm -hmm. depending on where you come from, depending on how you're raised, and the, the thing on, on your age, like the, the question they asked about good times, I wouldn't expect someone your age to know. But they had asked the same type of question about something that happened, like uh, they had asked the same type of question on uh, who, did, who did Whitney marry on a different world? Then I would expect someone in your, your age range to know. And that shared experience of, of black. So I don't, but then, it depends on, and this is gonna come out wrong, but I don't care what kind of black you are. Where do you come from? Do you come from the West Indies? Do you come from Europe? Do you come from Africa? Are you black American? So all those things, you can have a shared experience of blackness that's not a shared experience of blackness. I think the importance of all of that is that it's all blackness. Yeah, it, doesn't, right. it doesn't change what you are right. based off of your experiences. Yeah. Right. Right, so I wanna to go to the audience now because I know we have to wrap up soon. So uh, audience questions, Mr. Good, I believe you had a question, go ahead. Uh, just a, a general statement that being black doesn't mean what, what, what television show or, or what uh, person starred in a black film or, or music for that matter. Clearly, uh, Naima. Yeah. I know that's not true, go ahead. But yeah. Naima uh, is clearly black. She's just not educated on some of the things that some black people already know. That, and, and I thought that that was not such a really uh, seeming up there. But mm -hmm. I did have a question for her. Sure, go ahead. How did she, how did you channel, channel those tears? Because clearly, when you got upset, I saw your eyes filled up with tears. How did you do that? How did you do that? Oh. I know that's probably not a question that Nobody else was going to ask. But oh, yeah. I'm a trained tra tra actor. Got emotional. <laughs> yes. I did. I really did. Uh, yes, yes. I have been acting since I was nine. But um, I also used the stress that I was feeling throughout those five days of filming the pilot to let really use as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was really yeah. So, so you were tired, right? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Uh, who was uh, Red Jacket? Did you. Uh, Yeah. 
I like to see that in some uh, shows or then overcoming these issues instead of just getting stuck. So I guess the further you can show us how she overcame this. Oh no, absolutely. Because I don't know if you guys noticed, but my character Naima, um, she kind of comes off as snippety. Because um, I, when she entered to the apartment, the first thing she said to Muffin was, the neighborhood seems kind of sketch. But from what I can see, but then in the argument scene, I say to Anthony, you like comic books. Like, I, I, you know, I was making judgments as well. And I think that that's kind of, you can't really, I'm the protagonist, so of course you're on my side. But I think because my character is kind of coy and meek, you kind of overlook that. But I, I my character has things that she has to work on too. She has judgments as well. So. That's, that's something you just said. That's, a, that's definitely a conversation we need to have, too, yes. um, in our community. Uh, just because you said, just because I'm coy and meek, you, you don't recognize that I have judgments, too. And that, that is a, t we need to have a full dialogue yes. about that by itself. But, <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're going to use that. Just because I'm coy and meek doesn't mean I have judgments. Um, in the orange jacket, you had, you had a question. I arrived a little late, I'm sorry. So I, that was the first clip I saw, but I know, Naima, is that your character's name? Yes. She's from Massachusetts, right? Yes. Was that done on purpose? Yes. Like the writer? So with the other cast members, where are they from? Um, they're from Baltimore. Okay, that makes sense. So I, I figured, that, does that play more into like the like divide, like the racial divide, and urban from Massachusetts and being from Maryland to Baltimore? Yes, and she she also has white adoptive parents too. Okay, that's yeah, right. that you can really miss that part. Most people when they say you're from Massachusetts, they just assume you're like from the white area. Yeah, yeah, so, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Right. Right. Yeah. And Miss Hill, you had another? Yeah. The other, I thought, and seeing that clip, it's obvious to me that those young people need massive diversity training. <laughs> Is that the school teacher in you, Ms. Hill? There's <laughs> a lot of diversity training teaching teachers in Plainfield. But they, they need it desperately, and you can see some of the insecurities of the individuals, in addition to which coy and meek does not mean powerless. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's very true. Absolutely. Right down in front? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were saying you were working on some test right? Yes. So could you just elaborate on what that five year was like as far as like, this is the concept I have to now you're at Oh yeah. So mm -hmm. um repeat the question. Just sure, yeah. So I asked you said you were working five years as far as what that five years looked like and how you got to this point now where you're like Right. So yes, so I went to, I was the only black girl in my class from kinder, uh, from preschool to eighth grade. Um, and then I had my best friend, Chelsea, and um, we created a YouTube channel called The Cocoa Cream Show based on our life. <laughs> Me being Cocoa, obviously, and her being Cream. And I was like, oh my God, this is so interesting um, to, to write this, because I went to a, then a predominantly black high school, and that was just a whirlwind. I'm like, you know, this, I'm coming up with some really good, interesting things that I want to share, so I've been writing it. But as I got older, I was like, I still want to play the main character, so then I was like, okay, I'm in my 20s now, I need to make it to college. And then um, I wrote the script finally in 2016, and I went through three production companies. Um, obviously, it wasn't the right time, but it was really exhausting, and I definitely <laughs> wanted to give up many times. But thankful to my lovely cast, and crew who stuck <laughs> um, by me all those years, and they always encouraged me to keep going because they really believed in the project even when I didn't. And um, then my mom encouraged me to create my own production company, Faith and Purpose Productions, because Imani means faith, and me, I'm a middle name means purpose, which I try to live by daily. So I was like, yeah, we should own this own this work my, on my own. I should own it. So I was like, let's just do it on our own. So we finally did it in April, five day shoot, woo woo. And I'm so thankful that we did. All right, before we wrap up, do we have any more questions? Any final thoughts from Cass, Imani? Any final thoughts? Um, 
Thank you so much for watching. You guys are the first audience to see these clips. These are work in progress. We still have to do coloring and sound design and music score. But thank you so much for being the first people to watch it. And your laughs meant a lot. I'm happy that it resonated with you guys in some way. Thank you so much for being here today. Bye. Meet us outside at the uh, step and repeat. I think some people want to talk to you outside. Oh, yes, sure. Thank we're going to do a quick reset of the theater, guys, and we're going to kick off our next block at about uh, four o'clock. And this is a powerhouse, so you don't want to miss it. It only gets stronger and better from here. The movies from here on out are just going to knock your socks off. So stick around. <laughs>